All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the MGI webinar series. Uh, my name is Toby Huang, and uh, I'm the marketing manager at MGI. So uh, before we begin the webinar, just a couple of points to help you guys navigate our webinar platform. Um, so we will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. And uh, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, which you can click, and it will take you to a um, web form where you can submit your questions, and we will go over all the questions that we collect during the webinar, uh, webinar time. And uh, also, you can uh, send any additional questions uh, to mgi underscore info at genomics.cn. Okay, so today our topic will be on STLFR, single tube long fragment reads, a novel and cost effective approach for genome assembly. And we'll also talk about some of the other applications that we can use for this uh, long read technology. And uh, so after this webinar or our next webinar will be on September 6th, uh, featuring the design of experiments and WGS library preparation workflow. So please look out for our future webinar as well. Okay, uh, and with that, uh, let's get started. So first, uh, a little bit of background on the long read technology. So on the left side, you can see that um, current sequencing technology involves uh, nanopore or uh, 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 PacBio's smart sequencing technology, which is uh, basically reading very long fragments of DNA from the beginning to the end. Of course, the, the biggest advantage of doing this is uh, you can read very long fragments up to upwards of 100 KB. However, the downside is that generally these uh, platforms have a very high cost, both for the equipment and the reagent as well as a much higher error rate when uh, compared with the traditional short resequencing. So uh, one way to uh, address this is to do the error correction or also known as polishing using uh, short reads. But again, this will incur additional costs to the sequencing project. Okay, so on the right side, you can see that um, we, there's an another way of doing this uh, called using co-barcoding DNA. And uh, this is also known as uh, synthetic long reads. So the idea of co-barcoding was actually originally invented by the CSO of MGI, Roddy, uh, back in 2012. So this idea is basically involves uh, adding the same molecular barcode to all the sub-fragments that come from the same original long DNA molecule fragment. Okay. So by doing this, basically, we can use uh, short reads to do the sequencing, which has much higher accuracy and lower cost. And uh, other companies like Illumina have 10x have tried to adopt this technology. So 10x, they use the chromium microfluidic platform to do droplets to add the barcodes. And uh, Illumina have also tried to do similar things, but I believe their product has been discontinued uh, due to various reasons. Okay, so the, just a little bit of background on this technology. So originally, um, as you can see from this publication, uh, it was published in Nature back in 2012. And uh, since then, the, our research and development have optimized this technology and now is a widely adopted uh, technique that can be applied for not only de novo sequencing, but other uh, long read applications, such as uh, structural variation detection. So let's get a little bit more into the details of how this works. So a uh, couple of basic steps. Um, so basically, starting with our long fragment DNA, we first will do a transposon insertion. And this transposon sequence is basically what's going to help us do uh, the barcode, ligate the barcodes onto our long DNA fragments. And then after we added the barcodes, um, basically the rest of the steps are pretty standard. For those of you that are familiar with our MGI DNB-seq platform, this basically involves PCR addition of um, the adapters, um, circularization of the linear fragment, and generation of the DNB DNA nanobol libraries, and then followed by sequencing and analysis. Okay, so a little bit more details on each step. So we start with basically long genomic DNA fragments. So this generally you would need to use a high molecular weight 
DNA extraction kit to extract very nice long fragments of DNA. Okay, so and then um, basically we combine your long genomic DNA with a special transposome. And uh, our transposome actually features two transposes as well as two transposon sequences. And actually each sequence will be inserted on each end of the DNA to ensure that um, all, all along the fragment of the DNA we will get these insertions. So basically what's going to happen is the transposon will um, insert these trans uh, be inserted all along the length of our long genomic DNA. Okay, so once our long genomic DNA fragments have been inserted with the transposon, next is uh, we're going to add our clonal barcoded beads. So for the beads, basically we have generated a barcoded bead library that has uh, about 3.6 billion unique barcodes. And uh, on the surface of each bead, um, we basically, you can imagine there's about 400,000 copies of the same barcode oligo. Okay, so each bead on the surface, there's the same barcode. And then uh, basically in each, each uh, reaction, each sample, we usually use about 30 to 50 million unique barcoded beads. So each bead on the surface has the same barcode, but from bead to bead, between beads, they each have uh, different unique barcodes. And uh, typically for a input uh, amount of about 1.5 nanogram of uh, long fragment DNA, it'll, be, it'll contain about 10 million uh, molecules. So by doing this, you can see that there's a much higher ratio of uh, barcoded beads to the DNA, about a three to one or five to one ratio. And this ensures that um, each barcode beads will typically only bind one uh, molecule of long fragment DNA. Okay, so once we mix the beads with our DNA, next what's gonna happen is that the DNA is basically going to form a secondary structure all uh, around the bead and it's going to get captured by the bead. So this is, uh, you can imagine if the DNA is like a string and our barcode is like a ball, we're basically wrapping this piece of string around this ball. So a little bit more detail on how this happens. So as the picture shows here, um, on the surface of the bead, we have our barcode. And uh, basically all along the length of this long DNA fragment at many, many positions where we have the transboson insertion, we're going to use a, uh, an additional capture splint oligo shown, shown on the right, the gray capture splint oligo, which has a complementary sequence to both our barcode and our transposon sequence. So it's kind of like a linker that's going to link our uh, DNA with the transposon sequence to the barcode, which is on the surface of the bead. So once we've done this, we're going to ligate the barcoded oligo to our transposon sequence, which is uh, attached to our DNA. Okay, And again, this is happening at many, many points of contact along the full length of this long fragment of the DNA. And uh, as you can see the picture on the left, we show basically three different beads, each containing a different barcode and then each uh, uh, basically combining with a different fragment of DNA. So what's gonna end up happening is that each DNA fragment is going to get in, uh, ligated with uh, the same barcode for this individual fragment. However, between different fragments of DNA, they will have different bar barcodes. So each DNA fragment will have its own unique barcode, which we can later use to distinguish these long fragments of DNA. So this is the idea of co-barcoding. So once we have done the ligation, basically the next step is uh, we're going to digest the any excessive oligos in the solution. And uh, at the same time, we're going to remove the transposase. So by removing the transposase, basically it releases the DNA from the transposase and uh, basically it's going to fragment our DNA. So we actually don't have to do any fragmentation later when we do the library preparation. And then uh, after that, uh, we basically ligate a second adapter to the other end and we do a PCR amplification to basically add all the necessary adapters needed for the library prep. So by the end of this step, you're going to have basically many fragments of DNA uh, with their own molecular barcodes. And the barcode uh, will correspond to the original long DNA fragment that uh, this individual short fragment uh, originated from.
Okay, and the next step is uh, basically the standard library preparation protocol for all the MGI Seek platforms, which involves uh, circularization of our templates. And then we use rolling circle amplification to generate uh, DNA Nanoball library from the circular template, and then followed by just standard sequencing on the uh, MGI Seek platforms. And so during the sequencing, what's going to happen is not only are we going to read the DNA insert, we're also going to read the molecular barcode. And it is this molecular barcode that's eventually going to help us uh, guide this DNA back to the original fragment uh, that it came from when we do the mapping. So this picture basically shows that, you know, with traditional whole genome sequencing, when you don't have this molecular barcode information, mapping can be very difficult. You know, um, uh, back in the day when they did shotgun sequencing, it's basically you try to anchor just ran reads randomly. Or, um, you know, um, there are ways to separate long fragments into uh, wells and to kind of uh, do this uh, in a more organized fashion. However, here, since we have this uh, unique molecular barcode, we know that reads that have the same molecular barcode originated from the same long fragment of DNA. So as the picture on the bottom left shows, as you can see that each fragment of DNA has a few reads, and each of these reads have the same barcode. So again, this barcode information can help speed up this, this mapping process, because now we know um, which original fragment these reads uh, came from. So this is an actual mapping data from uh, chromosome 11. So this is for about a 500 KB DNA fragment. So as you can see here, uh, we have three barcodes uh, di in different colors. And uh, you can see that um, each barcode has a bunch of reads basically mapping for the same region, mapping to the same region on the chromosome. Basically, so indicating that these reads all came from the same original long fragment of uh, DNA. And uh, usually in between reads, there can be some overlap. So at the end, basically, we can assemble these overlapping uh, so-called assemble long reads into even longer reads, right? So this is how we can achieve basically long read information using short reads and co-barcoding. And uh, again, because of uh, the addition of these barcodes uh, re involves this forming of the secondary structure around the beads, um, Basically, the insertion of these barcodes will happen al all along the length of the DNA, and about 10 to 20 percent of the entire DNA fragment will get these barcodes. So there, there's definitely still some gaps, but however, this is already much better than the traditional uh, short read sequencing without the barcodes. And uh, so here, this data shows basically the number of uh, long DNA fragments that binds to each bead. So uh, you can see on the left that about at least over 85% of uh, long di uh, genomic DNA molecules bind to a single barcode. So then this we know that reads that share the same barcode uh, most likely came from the same long fragments. In some cases, um, maybe about 10%, uh, we have two DNA fragments hybridizing to the same bead. But usually this is not too much of an issue because uh, by probability, these two DNA fragments most likely would have came from different uh, chromosome. So when we eventually do the mapping, they will actually map to two general regions uh, in, in the genome. And uh, this slide shows the, the length of the DNA that we're able to capture with the beads. So the, the distribution peak is maybe around 50 to 70 KB and upwards of 300 KB. However, fragments longer than 300 KB is uh, kind of difficult to be fully captured because this you would basically need to wrap around the bead about 10 times. So usually we see about you know 50 to 7 KB fragments that get barcoded. In terms of the accuracy of uh, this type of technology, uh, because we are using short resequencing, so the accuracy is uh, very good compared to you know uh, the uh, third generation long reads. Um, so on the left, you see that we have um, used GIAB st uh, samples to do the SMP calling uh, using the Sentient software. And on the right side, we have uh, actually two standard libraries using just traditional um, MGI PCR-free library preparation. 
So you can see the, the accuracy and sensitivity for the SMP calling is actually comparable. Uh, for Indel, uh, the performance for STLFR is slightly lower because, um, uh, again, this comparison is with our uh, true PCR-free uh, library preparation on the right. Um, the reason being that the STLFR actually still involves a PCR step, right? So the PCR can really affect the performance of the Indel. However, this accuracy uh, is still uh, relatively high compared to the uh, uh, pack by our nanopore uh, long reads. Okay, so next we will talk a little bit about the applications for this type of long read uh, technology. So obviously um, when we have much longer reads, this definitely can help with uh, de novo genome assembly. Um, so traditionally, you know, um, we can, we use so-called the third generation long reads, but now you can use uh, so-called second generation short reads to achieve this long read information in a much more cost effective manner. So um, this data is actually a uh, combination of both uh, second generation and a little bit of third generation ONT reads, where we did a de novo for the human genome. So you can see the Contig uh, N50 and the Scaffold N50. So um, we basically use the nanopore long reads to close some of the larger gaps in this case. And so I think this is a this is a new approach to really get a more complete human genome, and uh, we call this so-called a new standard, the six seven six standard, for a more complete genome. Basically, can take N fifty more than uh, ten to the six power uh, base pairs, scaffold N fifty uh, more than ten to the seven, and uh, because now we have long range long read information, we can actually do uh, haplotype phasing, so we can actually. Um, sequence a diploid genome instead of just the original uh, three gigab gigabase uh, haploid genome. And I'll talk a little bit about phasing uh, later. And uh, this is uh, more um, de novo assembly data. So this is using uh, 10X's supernova software. Um, basically, um, since you know we use the same kind of barcoding method, um, basically we can just modify um, our uh, STLFR barcodes to fit into supernova's uh, UMI barcode program. And so you can see that the um, results um, comparing our data to 10x. Again, I think the, the emphasis is on, you know, we're doing this at a m fraction of the cost for the 10x data. And uh, again, this is uh, using purely just SDLFR. Um, we did this assembly with Sention, um, which involves uh, artificial learning to do the uh, s assembly. And again, you can see that the, you know, the scaffold N50 are all well above the megabase levels. And uh, earlier I mentioned the hybrid assembly, which we were also trying with uh, ONT data. So again, you can see a, m a much more drastic improvement in the contact N50s um, after we added a little bit of the ONT data as well. And here's just a general comparison uh, between different methods. So. Um, the first line, uh, STLFR plus a little bit of OMT data. Um, again, the cost is uh, much lower compared to if you just purely use PacBioSQL. And also in terms of the computing cost, you know, we're using less than one-tenth of the uh, computing power to do this. Also a much lower input for the DNA. And we're getting, you know, uh, almost uh, as good as the scaffold N50 as the PacBio. And of course, just, just using ONT alone, um, you know, you're unable to achieve um, this, this level of um, um, scaffold N50. And as well as the, the genome fraction is much lower when just using uh, ONT alone. Okay, and uh, so here's some actual examples of how we apply this for uh, de novo sequencing projects. So actually just uh, pretty recently, back in May, um, we did a collaboration with um, um, the uh, Institute of Zoology, which is part of, uh, part of the Chinese Academy of Science, and uh, two agricultural schools from China uh, regarding the invas invasive pest species, which is the fall armyworm. And uh, what's really amazing about this is uh, we completed the entire project from sample to publication in about 35 days, right? So we can really think about developing this technology into, you know, a white glove de novo sequencing service where, you know, people can just bring bring their species and have it done so quickly. You know, before a whole de novo project was basically your, your PhD project, now it's, uh, you know, done in about, in about a month. 
And uh, so we al we've also done um, the de novo assembly for a couple of uh, plants. So on the left is the lettuce, and on the right uh, is the teak, is a type of tree. And uh, again, y as you can see, the scaffold M50s, um, you know, is uh, pretty pretty high, um, especially for the teak on the right, is at the MB level. And, uh, and again, uh, uh, for we have also done uh, a lot of uh, de novo assembly of uh, marine animals, um, about 30 species, and uh, most, as you can see here, most of the scaffold N50s are at the MB level. And this is done purely just with the um, STLFR and short reads. Okay, so aside from uh, de novo assembly, uh, which has been shown to be uh, very powerful and cost effective when using STLFR. There's uh, also a lot of other applications we can apply this long read technology. So one of them is to do the phasing. So basically with traditional WGS, when you sequence the diploid genome, um, since we don't have long read information, what we end up getting is like the purple read on the right side of the screen where you cannot differentiate the different uh, haplotypes, right? So now, since we can apply this uh, long read technology now, um, when applied to this phasing application, as you can see the, from our data here, um, these two chromosome, on chromosome five and 11, where we circle the two arms, we have completely phased that entire arm on the chromosome. And for the other regions, you know, we can get pretty large uh, phasing blocks, as shown by the data here. And another application is for the mapping of uh, homologous regions. So for uh, genes with a lot of homologous regions or pseudogenes, where generally, you know, with uh, traditional reads, you, it's very hard to do the mapping. You would get a lot of multiple mapping or low mapping quality. However, now we have this barcode information. We know exactly which uh, uh, molecule of DNA from these two genes uh, these reads came from. So here's some actual data from, uh, this is IGB showing the mapping. Uh, so again, on the on you, you can see for SM1 S and SMN2 uh, on the left, on the top is the STLFR where we get not lots of nice reads mapped to the region. And on the bottom is just traditional WGS where you get very little mapping, mostly uh, mapping only to some of the more unique regions. So this again can drastically improve the mapping quality for homologous regions. Okay, and uh, aside from that, uh, another uh, ap application that we're really trying to get into is the detection of structure variation, which has you know uh, been very difficult when just using uh, short reads. So how we can do this is basically based on the idea of shared barcodes, right? So this picture basically shows that uh, you see a couple of different fragments of DNA where we have our uh, molecular barcodes. So the idea is that if two fragments are very far away from each other, for example, the green fragment on the top left and the blue fragment on the, on the bottom right, basically if they're very f far away from each other, there's very low probability that they will share the same barcodes. Right. However, if uh, when we have a structural variation, for example, when we have a deletion, fragments that are originally very far away from each other are now will be mapped clo very close together and they will share many, many barcodes, right? So we can use this logic basically to pre predict regions where we have such deletions. So this next picture shows, basically you can see on the right, um, basically there's a deletion happening from position uh, 34 A30 to position 34 7 A0. So at basically where we circled the uh, high intensities, uh, the red, High intensity basically indicates a high amount of shared barcodes. And uh, these are regions that are supposed to be very far away, but when we observe the signal here, that's indicative of a deletion, basically bringing those two regions very close together, and uh, hence they share many of the same barcodes. And again, uh, we can use this method. Um, here's, uh, we use the same method to basically de uh, detect a heterozygous deletion where you can see in haplotype 2, th there, there's a major deletion. And all the red and blue dots are individual reads that we have mapped to this region using the molecular barcodes. We can also apply this for detecting translocations. So actually, for in this case, um, for chromosome 12 and 5, 
we observed again in the red regions in the middle, they are sharing a lot of the same barcodes. So two different chromosomes should never share the same barcodes they because they should be very far away from each other. So generally when we see this, that's indic indicative of a uh, translocation. So in this case, the entire uh, arms on these two chromosomes were translocated. So this is showing um, data uh, based on 40 gigabase of data output. And uh, even when we reduce the data output, we can still observe the signal from the shared barcodes. And uh, if we, uh, when we run this for a uh, internal standard sample, of course, we don't see any sim signal at all because uh, you know this is just the normal chromosomes. They do not share any, any of the same barcodes. So again, you know, we can use this method to basically detect a lot of different types of uh, structure variations. And uh, besides that, um, we've also noticed that um, in some cases when we do the de novo assembly, we're able to detect uh, novel insertions that were previously not detected um, f um, when um, doing the traditional way of assembly. So this is, a, this is an example of um, showing where we can de detect a novel 5KB insertion when we did redid the de novo assembly using these barcoded reads. Okay. And uh, aside from that, you know, so again, this technology uses uh, short resequencing, so the, the, and the consistency, consistency is actually quite high. Um, so here is basically comparing two sample sets. Uh, one we use 1.5 nanogram, and one actually we just use one nanogram input. And uh, you can see the uh, concordance is uh, quite high. Um, in some case, actually, if you notice, for using uh, less input, we actually were able to to detect slightly more SVs. Um, this is because um, with less input DNA, you're basically getting uh, a, a much higher uh, coverage for the same regions. Okay, and uh, in terms of the comparisons for the other platforms, um, basically, um, I think the, the main take, take home message is that the because we're using the uh, second generation short reads, the sequencing cost is going to be much, much lower because, uh, for example, compared to PacBio, right? And uh, also the other advantage, as the name of, uh, of our technology indicates, single tube long fragment reads. So this entire reaction is carried out in a single tube reaction, meaning that you don't need to purchase any additional equipment to do this type of, uh, this type of library preparation. And all the sequencing is basically done on, on any of our uh, MGIC platforms. Okay, and uh, aside from that, um, this is another comparison with uh, 10x. So basically 10x, they use what's called a physical separation where they do the barcoding in a, um, in a dro liquid droplet. And so for us, we basically, it's a simulated separation where we just have to adjust the uh, ratio of the um, beads to the DNA to ensure that, you know, there's a lot more reads, a, a lot more beads than the DNA. And this uh, will ensure that each bead generally will bind to uh, one fragment of uh, long fragment of DNA. And of course, we've optimized the reaction to, to ensure that this, this binding is uh, done in an eff efficient way. Okay, so to summarize, um, basically STLFR is uh, basically a perfect balance of the cost, accuracy, and uh, application value, um, mainly using sh uh, short reads to achieve long read information, and of course, with this long re read information, we can have a lot of different applications for de novo, for SV, for haplotyping, phasing, et cetera. And uh, basically at MGI, we provide the total solution. So starting with the DNA inputs to the construction, to the sequencing. And we also have uh, analysis uh, soft both uh, software and hardware to perform the analysis. Um, and the software is also available for, for download on GitHub. Okay, and uh, with that, uh, I will conclude the presentation portion. And so for those of you that have any questions, um, please go ahead and uh, click the um, Q&A button and it will open a web form where we can, you can submit your questions. And uh, we will basically go through all the questions um, in this, this next portion. And at the bottom of the screen, we have some QR codes if you want more product information or if you'd like to download uh, some of the demo data from the SDLFR libraries, um, you can go ahead and do so. And uh, also for those who have attended uh, today's webinar, if you're also interested in sending some samples to do a trial of our SDLFR, 
uh, definitely reach out to us at MGI underscore marketing at genomics.cn. Okay, so next, uh, let's see, uh, let's take any questions.